Hi, my name is Gary Taylor, and in this video, we're going to look at mass transit sagas. And this is part of the mass transit learning course that I'm doing, where we're just going through mass transit and trying to play about and, and see what we've got. So let's head over to the documentation and see what's there. So we've slowly been working our way through this system and we can see here we've got sagas and we're talking about the ability to orchestrate. So this is an orchestration saga. Um, however, before we get into this, um, we start looking through the documentation. We can see there's this um, internal library that's now part of mass transit. Um, I think it was a separate library and this is really dealing with behavior. So we can see uh, that we can Look, use this library to look at um, events that occur or um, published messages and we can say right when something happens then I want this to happen so we can see how with this we can look at events and trigger other events based off some behavior and we can produce a, a rule system uh, that reads very similar to something like cucumber if you're gherkin if you're used to that where you say I've given this then that so initially, uh, when we're initializing, when we're order submitted, then we can transition to submitted. Um, uh, during accepted, if we get a submitted order, then just ignore it. So we can kind of work out what messages should be processed and where they should go. But I'm gonna do something different, if I may, because I believe personally that this is all too complicated unless you know what sagas are, unless you know what everything here is and means, then really this documentation I don't think is very helpful. Um, even with a great understanding, I don't think this documentation is the best. Uh, you simply can't just copy and paste this and have, uh, have sagas up and running on your system. Um, you need a little bit more than that. So let's work that out. So in this, we're gonna answer some common questions. What is a saga? Uh, what do you mean by a transaction or a scope? And what is choreography and what is orchestration? So heading off to Google, I tried to do a search for saga patterns and look at the images and just kind of see if I can work out a common theme. And out of all of these images, one thing that seems to pop out is the relationship between services and how multiple services are communicating with each other and sending information backwards and forwards. Now, that is okay, but the problem is, is that you really want to build your systems in a way that scales and doesn't have a great deal of intercommunication. But that is the golden dream in reality when you start building services you'll find out that they are coupled together and you want to loosen that coupling as much as possible so to help with that i'm going to look at um, microservices website and see if we can look at an example that they have so heading off at the microservices.io website which has got loads of great useful material uh, we can have a look at a, a problem set and the problem set that he's talking about is being able to have multiple services that all have their own database and are in charge of their own database as they should but yet you have some kind of transactional outcome think of a customer buying a product we need to reserve that product we need to um, take payment for that product and we also need to ship that product now, we don't want to do any of them out of sync. We don't want to ship the product without actually having an order in the first place. Uh, we also don't want to ship the product if we've not had a payment. And we may also want to roll back some of them things. Let's say, for instance, we take, a, we take an order and we reserve that product, but then the customer doesn't complete because the payment doesn't go through. Well, that order is still in a reserve state. The, that we now say that we've only got nine um, PlayStation 5s instead of 10 because someone's reserved it but didn't actually then complete the payment. That needs cleaning up. But the problem with that is that it tightly couples it and they're all, that data is all in their own database. So you, what do you do to solve that problem? Now, a common approach is uh, choreography where 
each service is responsible for not only doing its job, but for also telling the next service what to do. So um, here is a very simplified and overly complex example of an ordering service where an order comes through from the post, we create the order, the messaging system sends the order to the consumer, uh, to the customer service consumer. This processes the order and tries to reserve it and tells the system that it's been reserved and then that goes back through to the ordering system for it to do the second part. This tightly couples these two services together. They both act as one exchange or one contract or um, one transaction and one without the other is pretty pointless. Not only that, they are both aware of each other in the fact that they are both aware of the messages that are being produced and submitted. So there is a tight coupling, in my opinion, between these two services. A typical example of this is something that feels harmless, where you have a service that says, um, I want you to change a customer's password, please. So it changes the customer's password, and then it calls another service down here to send an email. Well, that's tightly coupling these three services, imagine this in real life, these three services together. And that means that if the email service changes or if we don't want to send an email, we want to send a push notification or we want to raise a message on the browser, then actually we need to unwind that extra step because it was the change password service that sent an email. So choreography is great for simple systems where the events are really simple and there is a logical chain of action that's not really going to change very often. Um, it might be that you're always going to send an email to a customer on a change password, but you might do something else one day. So the next one is orchestration. Uh, if you think of orchestration, um, consider it to be a central source of truth, a central person who's responsible for how events are going to be delegated to other services. And once again, I don't like this example. I don't think it's complicated enough to actually make it obvious what's going on here. But in the previous example, um, the orchestration system will take an event, it will record uh, that event and, and hold hold that information somewhere it's going to record and make it stateful and going to say right I have got this order I'm going to now send this off to an order system to the message broker there's no re real direct correlation again because remember that we are using a message bus so any service that listens to that command can that event or message can, can take it so this system says, right, I've got an order. I'm going to do a res I'm going to reserve it. And I'm going to reply back to say that I have reserved the message. So please reserve. I have reserved. And this is where the um, other information within uh, mass transit comes to life, where we have the difference between push and send and how we change our wordings to be um, an event versus a message. So here we have a, an event to say, please perform a reservation, reserve this. And we get something back to say that I have reserved it. Now in doing so, the orchestration engine can detect when that's occurred and move on to the next stage. But not only that, the orchestration engine can work out what that next stage should be. So if you have a complex system of business logic that's adapting and changing, on a regular basis, whether that be once every three months or once every day, then an orchestration system is the way to go because it is in charge and it handles what happens when that reserved response comes back. Once it's reserved, it may then go to a payment system. Once that payment system's paid, paid it can then go to the shipping system to order a shipment. Once the shipment has been shipped, duh, then a confirmation email can go to the customer to say that it's been shipped. And it's an orchestration engine that manages that. But the great thing about the orchestration engine is that it actually holds state of that customer's particular order. 
the order comes in and it will record to say, right, Bob has now ordered a PlayStation 5. I'm going to reserve it. So the reservation comes into the system and the reservation system says, right, I've reserved a PlayStation for Bob. Here's a reservation ID. And that comes back. The orchestration system now receives a reserved message with a reservation ID and it can then send that to a payment system. The payment system will then try and take payment and that will be paid from that reservation ID and that will become a payment ID. And now we've got a payment ID, this system will then send it off to a shipping system. Now the great thing there is that the shipping system doesn't care that it's a PlayStation 5 with you know 8K um, resolution and the, what the picture on the box is and the description. That's part of the ordering process. Um, the payment system needs a payment ID and needs to know what the customer's payment details are. That's going to be part of a separate system uh, regulated for taking payments. The shipping system only cares about the customer's um, address. It doesn't care about the images and the description of the PlayStation 5. It just needs to know the reservation, the item that was reserved. That's reserved. I'm paying for it now. And the shipment system will then send that product off to the customer. So this orchestration system can take the right data from the right systems, translate it to the next and send it off. And it can have logic that determines when and how and if that next event can occur. Once it's paid and completed and the confirmation order has been sent to the customer, then this saga, this data, this state of information is finished. Uh, the journey's done. Um, we have now successfully had a product reserved it, paid for it, shipped it, and sent a confirmation confirmation email to the customer. Might even send a testimonial out to say, how did we do? That is could be it, that can be, can be, could be considered done done. However, we might also have a, a UPS system that will tell us, right, no, we've sent it to the front door and it's been signed. And that completes the journey. Now, each microservice should not and must not have state, it's a microservice, they really should be as stateless as possible. Therefore, knowing what order this is in allows the orchestration engine to control it, to hold the state, to hold the information in a, a database somewhere. There, there's many databases that Mass Transit supports. And that would be the, the happy path, that's the, uh, a successful order going to completion. Now consider um, the shipping address is incorrect. Well, if the shipping address is incorrect and we simply cannot ship that product, then maybe our payment system needs improvement, maybe our front system needs validating. However, at that point, realistically, we need to undo this because we want to give the customer the money back because we were unable to ship it. We want to make sure that the stock take system uh, has got a new PlayStation 5 put back into stock and that's been rolled back. So we need to unwind all of the changes of this transaction. And remember, each microservice has its own database. Each microservice is independent, isolated, um, single source of truth and does a job well. Which means the ordering system that reserved that PlayStation has done it, it's reserved it but it now needs to be undone. You need to rewind that transaction. Now, within a traditional monolithic architecture with something like SQL Server, that was all done automatically because SQL's ACID system had a transaction. You would open a transaction, you would perform a lot of SQL queries against the database, and should anything fail, the transaction's rolled back and all of that data is rolled back to its previous state as if it never occurred. Now, there's, there's complexities to that, but basically that, that's what happens. However, with a microservice distributed system, you, that doesn't happen. You can't roll back because these things have no understanding of state or transaction. So here, the orchestration system really starts to pay dividends. If there is a problem with a payment, we can then submit messages to each service to roll back. 
and an event saying I've rolled back or uh, you know reservation undone or whatever you've decided to call that message the orchestration engine will update all the services and get that message back and at that point we were in a healthy state and it can retry and keep on doing its retry policies if there's a problem maybe the payment system's got a PDQ problem and can't connect to the bank or whatever so it just keeps on trying until eventually the state of this saga is now rolled back and if it can't get there for whatever reason um, then the system will can throw an error and a human being can go and have a look and work out why the saga was un unable to roll back the transaction as you can imagine this is very powerful and when we look through now the um, the documentation I'm hoping to see that it will make a little bit more sense so I'm gonna go through some of them really quickly here we have because I've got a, a demo and an example that I can show but we can see that the state machine is the glue for events and behavior and for triggering other events and this is a singleton or a single instance um, that controls this because you you want one central system that controls and orchestrates everything it becomes your your state machine or your saga now although you have one state machine remember that the state needs to record every order that comes in so every new order that comes in begins that journey of trying to uh, reserve it, trying to pay for it. So there is an instance that holds state. Now, every time there's an initial order and you've defined something that determines whether it's new, they call it the, the correlation ID. But for instance, let's say we get an order from Bob. If Bob repeats that same order, then it's going to get the same correlation ID. It's still Bob trying to buy a PlayStation 5. Well, he was in the middle of that already, so come on, Bob, stop it. Go to the payment system. That's what we want you to do next. The state machine can understand that and can see that Bob is trying to buy a PlayStation 5 and he's in the middle of it. So you can take a customer right back to where they were. If they hit F5, we're not going to lose where that customer is. The state management system is going to be able to remember where they were in the journey and hopefully continue it. And the state instance is the thing that contains the state machine, which holds the information about the state that the current customer is currently in. Now, there are multiple ways of storing state and storing data. Uh, I'm not going to go into this because one of the key things is to use state as a string. And I, I agree with that. I like that. But the idea is that you just store what is your current state. So, you know, order, booking, payment, shipping, the current state holds where you were in that journey. So within the state machine, you want to declare what your states are. Um, and when I say state, remember, this is the state of the current customer. Um, if you hit F5, where are they in the journey? Are they accepted? Are they sub are, we, are you trying to submit? Are you trying to ship? Are you trying to complete payment? So the state kind of determines that. And then the events allow you to perform a particular action to get you to the next state. So they sound very similar, but one is the action to accomplish something and one is the state that you're currently in. So you might be a... a brand new state when you first go to the website you've done nothing you're in maybe browse mode you could call it so you've got a state of browsing and when you submit an order then you go into the submitted state so the event is the thing that you're going to produce it could be the thing that causes it from that post call that we saw in the previous document where we say we want to submit an order and by doing that we want to get ourselves into this submitted state now, in order to do that, we want to create a correlation ID and say, right, we're going to take that order ID and use the order ID as the thing that we're going to correlate all of our future states from. In other words, that order ID is going to follow us all the way through to uh, completion and shipping and maybe even signing off on a testimonial. That's going to go all the way through that customer journey. 
And we're going to look at that to see if we're allowed to go to the submitted state. You know, if that product doesn't exist because someone's playing silly beggars and they've tried to order a product that, that we don't have, then it's not going to allow us to go to that state and the customer is not going to be able to get to that axe journey. And all of that logic can be controlled with behaviors. Now, of course, no one wants a system to go all the way to shipped and, and completed without first the order being taken and without the payment being taken. And it's quite easy in some systems to bypass all of that if you know the URLs and the locations and the message and the, uh, the objects that are needed, the data that's needed to get a website into a shipped state because there is no actual sagas or events keeping track. If you just hit the correct endpoints of the correct URL or the correct messaging system, it will just do that and ship it. Now, I'm not saying that sagas are a security mechanism. Of course, you need to build your own security mechanisms and make sure that doesn't occur. You know, you should be each object and each um, microservice needs to understand security and, and have that as its forefront. But you can use um, the orchestration engine to ensure that messages go in the right order. So here we've got initially when we submit an order, we want to go to submit it. Well, I said that before. When when an order comes in, when we're brand new and the customer submits an order, they're in this initial initialized state, brand new, do, nothing to do. They're browsing the website. They submit an order. But then we need to get it to the submitted state. So the action was, or the event, let's say, to, to use the right wording, the event is submit order. However, we transition to submitted state. So we're no longer in the initialized state of, of browsing. We're now in a state of submitted. Hit F5 on the browser and we've got it in the basket. We have the ability to move on to the next step. And you just in, keep on including all the events and all the states that your system needs. This is really powerful because you can unit test your um, state machine to ensure that the business logic is doing what you'd expect it to do. And it becomes really easy for product owners and people to understand, you know, given we submitted, when we get an order accepted, then we want to transition to accepted. Well, if you get an order and it's been the order has been accepted, you want the state of the customer to be accepted. And that kind of makes sense, right? It's, it's really obvious as to what's going on. Now, how that's happening under the hood, we'll get to next. Just remember here that this is the behavior. Nothing's actually happening here. No messages are being sent or submitted or pushed or no work is being done. No, no, that's not going to send a PlayStation 5 to Bob. That's going to do nothing. It just allows you to move between states and the whole state in data, uh, in a database somewhere. The magic comes next when you start linking it together into your, your consumers and producers. So I'm not going to go too far with, with the behavior now. I think we kind of get it. Um, you can control how things happen. You can say that during something you can go to this. So what is our initialized state? Well, you definitely can't go from browsing to paid. You know, that would be crazy. But you can go from... Um, initialize browsing to an order accepted order submitted and we can chain these things together so when order submitted go to submitted when order accepted go to accepted um, during submitted we get an order accepted and we move to accepted and we can even ignore this now, I'm not 100% sure about this logic because it seems to be doubled up um, for instance um, during submitted, well, we've got submitted here that we're transitioning to via submit order. Um, when accepted, order accepted, which is the same as that, and transition to accepted. So submitted allows an order accepted, and then it moves to accepted. It feels like the same thing, but I'm sure I'm missing something. But we, before we go to wire this up, um, another thing I find very useful is that you can take data from one message and pass it down to the next. 
So we can here we can see that the order was submitted. We got the order date and we passed it down into the next SAGRA event, which will then get submitted to submitted. So now submitted has got the order date. And you can see how you can use the right message at the right time with the right data and data can be moved down the chain. And because this is all so super easily unit tested, you can ensure that your data moves through the journey and that you get the right information at the right time. And also you take out data that's not needed. You know, the information about the order might include the images of the PlayStation 5 or the URLs and the description. Well, that's not needed in the shipping information. So the data can be serialized and cleaned and adapted to, to meet the requirements of the next event. And finally, configuring this is crazily simple. Uh, we're using the services, um, uh, iService Collection from, from .NET. Uh, I recommend we use that all the time um, because we can just use the ext um, extension methods to call this and we can, using mass transit, we can add the state machine. And we add the state machine and we add the actual state. And here we're choosing to use in memory for unit testing. And there's also a, uh, a test harness, I believe, that we can use. But this means that we can just get up and running, testing our saga pattern and making sure that it's great. In production, you wouldn't use that, don't use that. Use one of the databases that it supports. So you can see Azure Tables, Cosmos, uh, Redis. Almost everyone has a Redis cluster hanging around somewhere, so it's a, it's a great choice. So the rest of the documentation starts talking about how you manage your correlation IDs, and we, we've got other videos on that, so I'm not gonna go into that. Um, however, what I wanna do is just quickly show how um, uh, events can be chained uh, within publish. So before I said that we were just changing states, we just had this logical bucket that held data in memory and we called it. And remember, nothing happened. No events were really, no actual work was being done. We were just changing data in a database somewhere. Uh, great for fun, but doesn't actually do anything. We actually want to call our microservices and raise events. We want to make sure that our consumers that are listening to these events that we've got wired up to do their particular job, like reserve a, a product, are going to get the message when the particular event happens. And to do that, we're able to create um, something called activities. An activity is what activity do you want to do when an event happens? What code do you want to run? What is it that I'm supposed to do? The actual real work. And here we can write activities directly within the behavior. So we can say that given we got an order submitted, well now we need to do something with that. We need to publish it. And we've seen publish now many, many times in the other videos. So we're going to publish an order submitted event using this correlation ID and it's going to be an order submitted and we're going to send that off and then once that's been sent we're going to transition to submitted so this is where now we can get a consumer to do something based off an order submitted so this isn't actually as clever as it all feels when we're reading the documentation it's not as complex and and complicated as it it, it feels at first just remember we've got an orchestration that deals with events based off some behavior or some logic will then publish or submit or send a request to a consumer and then transition ourselves to the next state. So we're tightly coupling lots of services together but remembering how whilst not tightly coupling the services together, allowing them to work independently isolated without any understanding of state but we've got this other guy who's responsible for managing that state and telling the system what to do. An orchestration. And there's a couple of ways of doing this with publish and async, and we can use the send mechanics and send async as well. And we can also um, get a respond. So a state machine can respond to a request by configuring the request message type as an event. 
So in other words, it raises an event and using the respond method can get that data. So when we get an order cancelled request, we can actually change that to an event which is then order cancelled and we can respond and we can transition then to cancelled. So that means we don't necessarily have to have a order cancelled consumer or queue or messaging system. We can actually do all of this within the behavior. And that's how I'm considering that. I need to research that a bit more because there's, there's more logic and more complexity there than what I've just said. So to make sure that this video doesn't turn into a three or four hour video, what I'm going to do now is start looking at the individual components and showing you a demo. So I want to just look at the autonomous and see how that works. And then I actually want to uh, review a demo that shows all of this plumbed together. And I think that becomes a, the really useful bit. Um, here, the remainder of this is just the response schedulers, requests and, and custom um, activities. The custom activities, I think, is worth mentioning here in that you do not want to write all of your code within the behavior because that could get really, really messy. You end up having one file with all of your code in it. So here where you're publishing your activities, actually you might have lots of code here, lots of logic that looks at the data, looks at the information, makes calls and does stuff. Maybe it calls other consumers to get information and then works out what to do. And that logic then becomes tightly coupled. So your behavior now becomes tightly coupled to the implementation, making it difficult to test. Well, what you can do is you can take your activities and activities is that you know the stuff here that's doing stuff and move it into its own custom class so although it says custom actually what it's just saying is run it somewhere else when you write your code here then i can call it from somewhere else so here we have exactly the same code as our behavior but now we have a dot activity and it says when this run this and it's going to just run a type of published order submitted activities or whatever you've called it and then this code runs so you can have all of your code in a separate place but also because we're doing this what we can do is we can mock it out and we can make sure that uh, we can test our state machine without actually calling and doing real things which is it's very useful so let's now get into a, a demo of the autonomous system and let, let's see what that looks like and how that works. So here I have a state machine for a turnstile, turnstile system. Um, can't say the words correctly, sorry. That is when you go to the toilet and you in an airport or a train station, you've got to put some money in and then the turnstile allows you to walk through it. And this is a, a system that holds some very simple state. When you first go to it and you try and push it open, it won't budge, it doesn't move. You've actually got to put some money in. So you put your money in and then it moves. But then the next person who comes along isn't able to push it. They've got to put some money in, they turn it, and it then becomes locked again. So the states that you've got really are, it's either locked or unlocked. And there are a couple of events that happen. So we were either locked or unlocked and really not a great deal else happens with a turnstile. But there are things that can happen. For instance, when someone first installs the turnstile, they'll get it, they'll, they'll set it up and they'll get it in a, in, a, in a state ready for people to come along. People can insert a coin. People can push the turnstile. The coin can actually be banked, so realistically that coin that you've put in, you can have a push a button and get your money back, or you can go in and, and um, push the turnstile and the, the coin then drops down into the bottom and there's like some tub at the bottom that you can hear it dropping into, so you can drop the coin. And I also just want an event just for printing, but I've not used that because uh, an engineer can come along and click a button in the back and it can print out today's statement to work out um, what the balance is. So if you think about that actually, there's also money in this turnstile, isn't there? So wouldn't it be great if we actually knew how much money was in there? So if we look at a turnstile, um, 
I want a history of every event that's happened. I want to know when things have happened with my turnstile because I'm very nosy. I want to know how much profit we've been made and I also want to know what's currently in the bank. Um, what I mean by that is if a customer comes along, a user, and they keep on putting 20p's in, well, if they've put five 20p's in, there's a pound in there, right? And they're banking that money. But once that money's then dropped down into the bottom and it becomes per pay profit, I want to know how much profit I've got. And the user can actually press the eject button and whatever's banked currently then just falls back into the train. They can take it out. So if a customer sillily puts in, a user comes along and puts in, you know, a hundred coins into this thing, then when they click the eject button, they want to get them hundred coins that have been banked out. But they certainly shouldn't be getting anything that's in the bottom bucket, which is no profit. Another person's 20p shouldn't be given to them just because they click the eject button. That would be a bug. And we can control all of this via the behavior. And what I want to do is when the engineer comes and installs it, well, we're going to install it and we're going to set it up so that we have nothing banked and we have nothing in profit. We're making the assumption that when the engineer installs, he's going to take all the profits out and take them with him. But when installed, he must leave it in a locked state because if he doesn't, then it's now free and everyone can just keep on coming along or at least the first person who comes in gets it for free. So we want to make sure that initially when we're installed, we're going to transition to a locked state. So if we have a look at that and we run this, we can see that first things first is we want to install it. So yeah, we're going to install it. And then when we're installed, we want to get to a locked state with zero bank and zero profit. Well, we can see here now that our current state is zero banked and zero profit. And originally we had zero and minus 10. And the current state is locked. And I have a history object here that has an array and that says installed. So we know the first thing that ever happened to this uh, turnstile was it got installed. So let's have a look at running that. What does running that look like um, within a unit test or within code itself? Because don't forget, this is just classes. So we can run all this stuff by hand instead of running this through our orchestration engine. So we create our data, we create our state machine, and then what we do is we raise an event and we say that we want to run install. Well, we saw initially we called install and we got it into this installed state, which is great. I want to now come along and I want to push the machine. So I'm going to push this and I'm going to try and get in without paying. And we can see a message that says pay up. Um, actually, we're not able to push it. We're still in this locked state. So we need to insert some money. But if we first do that, let's have a look at the behavior. I'm trying to go from push. And at the moment, I'm on this installed state. So you need to navigate down and try and find it. But what we're saying is during lock, because that's the state we're currently in now. We're in locked state because we fully installed the turnstile. When someone tries to push, then say, nah, sorry, pay up. And we're, we're done, nothing else to do. And I'm just adding this to the history so we've got a collection of this. So we saw that after we installed it, someone came along and just tried to push the turnstile. And this is really cool. We can see what happens with our turnstile in history. So we can replay it if someone manages to, to get money when they shouldn't or push it open when it should be in a locked state. We can replay the history and find out what. We can also see we've got no money, nothing banked. So let's go and put some money in. We can't push it. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a coin in. Uh, and let's give that a run. Now, going from locked to someone putting a coin in feels correct. That's that's fine, yeah. So we we called this and we accepted the fact that we were able to put a coin in. And when the transition is now unlocked 
because we got 120p and that's all it takes to unlock this turnstile. So we're now in an unlocked state and we can see that we've got one coin banked. So that's pretty good. We now can test this and make sure that this turnstile is doing what we expect. So this is where um, we have a locked state. We've been given a coin. Output message just so we can see it. We increase the bank by one and then we unlock. And then we add this event to history. So we can see now we came along, we installed, someone put a coin in, we've got one coin and we are now unlocked. If we continue the journey as such, what we can now do is push the turnstile open. And let me just take another print so we can see the state changing as we move between these journeys. So great, we came along, we installed, we successfully installed. So we've gone from a minus 10 to an installed state. Uh, during locked, we got a coin. So we've transitioned to unlocked and we've got a coin banked. Then we push. And because we've pushed, the coin is now dropped down into the bottom. We've banked the coin. So now we're back in a locked state because we pushed the turnstile and we are now locked again. And we can see this history. We can see we installed, a coin went in, a coin got banked and pushed. Now, technically, there should be the other way around because we should push and then it should bank the coin. So maybe that's a bug. But we can also see we got one coin as profit and there is zero coins banked. So we're in a really good position now. We've made some profit and we've got some history and we've transitioned back to lock state. That's really the end of this journey now. We're, we're at the end of it. But there's nothing stopping us uh, as, a, as a user of this to keep on adding more and more coins. Because even though the system clearly states it's only 120p that's needed, well, there's nothing stopping us as a user from continuing to just add money. But forgive me, I've actually fixed this. What we're doing here is we've inserted a coin and it's been banked. And we can see here, during locked, when coin, then we're okay. Now we're unlocked. When coin, then drop coin. So what's happening here now is that instead of stealing people's money, we've decided to be nice and altruistic. And if they put that second 20p in, it's actually just going to get dropped down into the uh, return slot. So it just keeps on giving it them back. Therefore, even though the person's put in three coins, we have only got one in the bank to drop in and the remaining coins have been dropped back to the customer for them to take back to make them aware that actually you, you've paid up. You only just need to push now. So I'd, I'd forgotten I'd written that in, but it was a nice mechanic because we wanted people to have the money back. So we're able to track information about the current state of what's banked and perform additional actions. That's how we can record state of all these things. Now I know that this example is a little bit silly and I struggled myself trying to work out how does this work with a real distributed system. What I, all of this is just in memory, it's not going to do anything. But remember that you want your activities that raise events across microservices. So when I am doing stuff within the state machine, the thing that I am missing is the call to publish because I'm just doing this in memory at the moment, just playing about with the behavior, getting trying to get this autonomous working correctly in the way that the business wants it to work. Once done, I can actually call APIs, I can call consumers, sorry, and I can raise, publish, and send events that will then trigger work to be done. The things that do the work don't need to be aware of this state. For instance, the thing that drops the coin down to give a customer a refund it doesn't know that it's Bob that's at the turnstile putting in 20 P's like it's a team, uh, a sweep machine. Um, 
it just returns that money. And it's being triggered via the behavior of this orchestration, which means the orchestration holds state, knows where things are and what needs to be done and holds the logic whilst the consumers just do their job well. So to finish off, I want to show a semi-working example. Now this is not my stuff, I've, I've, I've taken this from GitHub, um, descriptions and details below in the comments. Um, have a look, I've just updated it to .NET Core 6 and just changed a few things to get it to work. Um, and I'll try and submit a, a, a fork on that or a PR to the, to the original owner. But let's have a look at a, a real demo and see how this is actually then wired up. So here's some code and there are a number of different projects. Each one of these would be a, a microservice. We've got some shared context for um, our contracts. So this is something that's just, you should be used to as part of mass transit. So these are just interfaced contracts, nothing special. And we have uh, a little object that's designed, a little uh, project that's designed to generate that order. So it, it's just going to process that order. Of course, that would be a website or a customer actually submitting an order by clicking on, uh, on a link somewhere. Um, but here we, we, we just need to trigger that in code. So that generates the order. And this is just simple code that will send out a message. Most of this is boilerplate code. So all of this is setting up the bus, so nothing special there. But here we um, have a loop, we generate an order and we publish it and that's it. Now, because we're the thing that generated the order, it's nice to know when the order has been canceled or the order has been processed. So we also have consumers which can handle them events because as the person who generated the order, I'm actually quite interested in them events. So let's work through them. We have a, an order that has been submitted. We have a warehouse that's responsible for reserving the order. Then we have the cashier who's responsible for taking the payment. And then we have a, a dispatcher which is responsible for shipping. So it's really logical. Warehouse makes sure that the, the item's been reserved. The cashier works out the payment and the dispatcher ships. Each of these services are independent, isolated, self-managed microservices. They are deployed and updated and maintained at their own, in their own cadence. And as long as they conform to the contract of the interface, there is literally no work to be done. They can be updated and maintained. So if the reservation system needs to move from SQL Server to Cosmos, the developers can do that work and ship out a new warehouse consumer and nothing else changes. But something needs to be in charge of keeping track of the orders and the state. Where is the customer in the journey with these microservices? Where's Bob's PlayStation 5? So within this code, it's in a system called Order Processor. Um, you can obviously call it whatever you like. But here we have a state machine and we have some state. So here's Bob's order and we can see the order. We can see when it was created, when it was updated, a correlation to keep track of it. Um, we have some state information about what the current state is and a version as well. And here is the state machine. Now it's a little bit more complex than the state machine we had for our turnstile, but the, the mechanics are exactly the same. We have events, we have state and we have behavior and events move between one state. We set when we first initialize the state machine, we want to set it to an initial state. We want to configure the correlation. We want to get it to its initialized state and then we want to set up what happens during processing and what happens when we complete and the order is done done. So correlation, remember you might have 
a, a variable or a value within your, your system, which is your correlation, the thing that you want that Bob's order to be tracked by and each DTO might have something unique so you can change your, your correlation but here basically every object is going to use the correlation ID now there are easier ways of doing it than this but uh, uh, there's a video that I've done on correlation which is part of the previous tutorials you can have a look at now what's happened is the activities that happen as part of the behavior has been added as, as separate functions so they've not been added as classes that are separate, they're actually just separate functions. It's cleaner, it's a little bit better to maintain, but actually I think it it makes it difficult to see what's going on uh, because you can't actually see the behavior here, you can just see what happens. So the correlation now here, the behavior is during processing, do this. Um, and I'm, uh, forgive me, I know the code looks slightly different, but there are the only real difference is the way that we're using functions rather than lambdas and things. So uh, during processing, we run set stock. So let's go into that. So we need to now remember that we're in the processing state. When stock reserved, then update saga save our order, print out that reserved, and send a, a next command to process payment. So when we reserve the stock, and stock has been reserved because our stock, to stake, stock take system has done it, then what we wanna do is process the payment. When the payment's been processed, what we want to do is ship. And when we've shipped, what we want to do is complete. And I think things like this are really useful to draw on a whiteboard and, and draw the lines and say, right, when we do this, we go to this. When we've done this, we go to this. So look at this in that the, um, the system that um, submits an order, uh, sorry, here, the, the system that actually reserves stock does not tell the next system to start processing payments. The, the warehouse knows nothing about payment, nothing at all. It doesn't know that that's the next step in the journey. It is simply going to reserve in the warehouse and take that PlayStation 5 off the shelf and reserve it somewhere for Bob. Now the orchestration system is gonna get back the reserved event. And we're gonna be in a state of stock reserved. So when we come back and we press F5, Bob has some stock reserved. And because of that, we can then transition to processing payment. The cashier system that processes the payment, this code here, this cashier, knows nothing about the warehouse or shipping. It just manages payment. And when the payment has been processed, the state, the state is going to go to payment processed. And the same again, the payment processed is now going to go to a state and the, this orchestration engine is going to send out a command to I shipped. And the dispatcher, um, can't really, oh, the dispatcher, it knows nothing about cashier ordering or process. It's just going to send out the PlayStation 5 to Bob and it's gonna have the right information in its instance, it's gonna have the right data pushed in for it to ship that product. Once the dispatcher shipped it, then we're gonna get an order shipped, and we're gonna be in an order shipped state. So see how events relate to state, and how events then trigger us to be in a new state, and because we're in a new state, we're able to run other events. So this takes some getting used to and can feel quite complex, but really, honestly, once you play about with it, you'll realize you'll have the eureka moment. So it is worth keep banging your head against it and trying to work out what all of this means. It took me a while. So when order shipped, then we're able to move um, into a finalized process and we're done. The order has been processed and we have finished. Bob's gonna get his PlayStation 5, hurrah. 
Now this orchestration engine works just like the other consumers. Instead of registering a um, consumer, so here, uh, if you look at the program, we'll go through and we'll register a consumer and we'll say that, you know, this queue will then get a message. If that queue's got a message, we're gonna send it to the order shipment consumer and this is going to do this and then it's going to raise back a published event to say that it's been shipped remember that's just to say that it's been done so that's doing it i do the work now i've done the work i'm going to tell someone somewhere that i've done the work well the person that you're telling is the orchestration engine so this is the same kind of code over and over it's boilerplate set it up configure when we get a payment processed in our queue then we're going to run this code to uh, process the payment. When we've processed the payment, I just want to tell someone that I've processed the payment. It's been processed. And this is where the wording is you've got to think about if there's a doing done pretense. And something somewhere is going to listen to that message. Well, it's going to be the saga that listens to their messages and say, well, you've done that. Great job payment system. I can move on to the next part. So here we go. In order to do that, we register the consumer. And I've just got a custom mass transit pattern. So don't worry about this. This is just so that we can register mass transit. We are registering the state machine. So beforehand, where we were registering a consumer, we're registering the state, mach the state machine. And what we're saying is this microservice is going to be responsible for handling the state machine it's going to have the, the state of the data a state machine that has the behavior and it's going to store all of the logic in a mongo database now these are just swappable with whatever you've got whether it's azure tables or redis whatever you will just swap that out and then final bit is just to configure all the endpoints so that when you get them messages, the behavior will run. So when you get the um, payment accepted, uh, product reserved, all of them messages will translate into events, which will then be run by the behavioral system to then send out further messages. If you're still not clear what's going on, don't worry. What I want to do now is just show you this running if I can. And I want to show that by generating an order and just simply calling this method to create an order and submit it, what's actually going to happen is five or four other events are going to work in tandem just to this one submitted order. So I'm just going to fire all these um, projects up and give that a go. So great, I've got my warehouse. I've got my cashier, I've got my dispatcher, and I've also got the Saga system, which glues all of these together. And what I'm now going to do is run the order generator. So the order generator is running. It's really simple. This is just going to take a key input and then generate a, a random order. So if we do that, we can see that we get the order. Now, if we look at the Saga system, uh, we'll see that we got the order. We're trying to process payment. So forgive me, sorry, yeah, Odd, um, order submitted. We reserved the stock and then we took payment. So from this one call to try and place an order, the order was taken in via our uh, processor. It took that and then sent the message off to our warehouse to reserve it. The stock got reserved and then we sent that off to the cashier. Now the bit that seems to be missing actually is the uh, dispatcher. And I'm not quite sure why at the moment. So apologies, I just paused for a little bit and we've got an order shipped now. It was working, it's just there wasn't any console output so we, we couldn't see it. Um, the interesting thing to note is that um, when I restarted this system after making this change, I did get some other um, orders submitted because the, the events were still hanging. 
which kind of demonstrates the fact that this is all stored in state and stored in a database. So even a restart meant that we didn't lose things. Um, a restart of the engine and the orchestration engine wasn't catastrophic. It was able to recover and able to carry on consuming and moving messages to the next state, which was really, really cool. So I think this demonstrates um, how a relatively complex chain of events can occur from one event and how you have an orchestration system that determines what them events should be and how this should work. So that we can't go to order shipped if we haven't submitted an order, reserved stock and took pay payment. But each microservice doesn't need to be aware of this business chain, this business logic, and that doesn't have to be tightly coupled into your system. Meaning when the business decides to change something or, or we want to trial something, it doesn't become a, a major project. This is just something that can be trialed within a new consumer, within a new saga state. And it also allows us to quickly see and identify how this chain occurs. Now, there are ways of, ways of turning this behavior into a diagram automatically. You can use mass transit to actually point it at your state machine and it'll generate documentation and a diagram that explains how these things are linked together. But if you have a, um, a mono repo, which I highly recommend, what you're able to do is take a look at these things and look at the particular interfaces and work out what happens in them particular in that scenario. So I order submitted, if I just do a find for that, we can see how um, order submitted is handled and how order submitted can then be trans um, uh, transitioned to processing once the, we've reserved the stock. And we can see where in the system this message is being used and how it happens. So this is incredibly powerful because you can track the behavior across all of your microservices, even though they are independent, you can always use this to work out what happens at a particular state. So, you know, I stock reserved, how, how does that work? Where does that come from? Well, we can see from the state machine that the uh, reserved comes from uh, reserving stock and our reserve stock is when we um, submit an order we're going to try and call out to reserve stock and then we can get a reserved stock so it becomes easy once you know where to look and how to look at it and this code can be cleaned up and we can move these actions into their own but that is sagas now sagas are a quite complex to understand but once you understand them they become simple as, as a lot of things do take time to read documentation to watch videos and to play about and i hope that this video has helped you in understanding a little bit more about the saga pattern and how mass transit helps you implement it if you like give a thumbs up